so what what's what's weird about this guy is that he, he was he was gigantically influential so he never got first of all he didn't have a university post he never had any formal education after uh the age of 14. you know but but he was like praised by everybody from bernard shaw to uh to albert einstein to you know um john dewey uh and and his book became the best-selling book of the gilded the Gilded Age, Gilded Age, Gilded Age, all of the, the, the best-selling book next to the Bible. I mean, can, can you believe that? And this guy was like a, like an immense figure in the world. <clears throat> what was he called? And what so, was he called? It's called Progress and Poverty. And I mean, this is, like I say, the book has gone through 15 translations in foreign languages. Yet... Uh, has gone through somebody like 59 editions in English. Um, it's just this immensely influential thing. I mean, it, in many ways, it gave rise. It was the thing that shaped, um, you know, Nock and Chodorov and all these guys, so these so-called old right, who then in turn, you know, gave rise to Rothbard and American libertarianism. So he's he's kind of one of the fathers of American libertarianism in a, through a circuitous route. Um, so, and I've never read this book, right? I mean, it's like I see it in used bookstores all the time, right? And, you know, sitting on the shelf and you think, uh, I'm supposed to read that, but then you never do. So, but, uh, now I'm, I'm actually reading it. And it's, it's a weird, uh, it's a weird book. Very, very compelling. And like I say, it's got a lot to recommend it. But you can see why everybody's borrowed from it, you know, from the left to the right. And, he just has this idiosyncratic, uh, almost like crank, crank view that, that the one big, that, that the problem of, of universal prosperity is being, I mean, the possibility of universal prosperity is being held back by monopolies. But, and, and all monopolies, but the worst monopoly by far is the land monopoly. So we need to kind of like, it's, it's too bad we can't abolish private ownership in land. But we can at least tax the hell out of it. So he advocated this this this, this huge land tax, right? Um, and the and the end of all other ta taxation. So tariffs, you know, excise taxes, everything. Uh, and he hated inflation. He was a gold standard guy, you know. So I don't know. It's just it's he's kind of he's kind of crazy. Um, but it's it's it makes an interesting study to like try to figure out like why. Why was Henry George, you know, such an epic figure, you know? And why did the book become so immensely, incredibly popular? Yeah. I mean, it was, it wasn't just this, the this, this second best selling book next to the Bible position wasn't displaced until Rand's Atlas Shrugged come, came along, you know? Which you're reading now too. Yeah, I'm so I'm reading like the most important book of the late 19th century and the most important book of the 20th century at once. <laughs> well, it's about the time. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but you guys, um, but but you haven't you haven't you haven't read, read Progress and Poverty, right? I mean, a lot of it reminds me of this new book, Pickety book, you know, on inequality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm that everybody's mm -hmm. obsessed about there's something weird about this uh and it's it makes for a fascinating psychological study like what is it that that terrifies people so much about inequality like what what is it that gives rise to this weird uh anxiety you know that that the teeming uh, masses are are um are, 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 are sort of permanently poor no matter how productive the rich get, you know, and, uh, you know, giving this, this rise to this fear that there's going to be some kind of, you know, revolution or revolt that's going to change life, you know, fundamentally, you know, it seems there's, this, this seems to be like a, a perpetuating fear, you know, I mean, that's what George was kind of playing on. And that's what Piketty addresses now, you know, so hmm. it's it's a very interesting kind of kind of obsession that people have. It's like we better address the problem of inequality or we're gonna lose everything. You know, they're just 
they're going to come after us and slit our throats. You know, <laughs> that seems that seems to be the driving uh, motivation here. So you think there's a connection between land and inequality and in a sense or not? In a sense. Well, that that's what he believed, but I think that I, I think that his whole theory is basically cr crankish and crazy. Um, it makes no sense whatsoever. Um, but he, you know, he wrote like this gigantic book on the subject and just like pushed this idea. Uh, I mean, there was an illusion I think alive at the time that um, there was a kind of a, a class of landowning capitalists who weren't actually doing anything, but were getting enormously wealthy because of the rising land values. And so, like, okay, what was giving rise to like explosive valuations and land in say the eighteen, you know, seventies um, and eighties? I mean, there were there were basically two things, right? There was westward expansion and the railroads. Oh, you mean the U.S.? Uh, you mean the U.S.? Yeah, in the U.S. Because that's the case he's addressing, right? It's the U.S. So uh, it and it was like freaking him out, like, well, you know, if you own this this stupid little plot of of land, you don't have to do anything. You just become the owner. Meanwhile, the the teeming masses are out there laying the tracks. You know, they're building the towns. They're they're uh, they're they're doing all, all the work. Chinese and there's some fat cat. Chinese coolies. Yeah, and there's some fat cat who just because he has the title to the land, and, you know, does nothing and watches his wealth just just grow immeasurably higher than all of the workers and the laborers who are doing this. So this like was. Um, Basically, it was unconscionable to him, you know, he couldn't stand that. So he thought because land is a fixed resource um, that can't really grow. And, and so therefore, it, like owning it doesn't like all the material benefits for the uh, increase of land valuation accrue to just a single class, a single person. Uh, they're not dispersed out um, among the population more widely. So he postulated that land was the one thing that really should not be privately owned. I mean, you can you can kind of see like like how this in a crankish 19th century way this this theory kind of spins spins itself out, right? So was he American actually? So was he American actually? Oh yeah, oh. an American original, a newspaper man. I somehow yeah. thought he was a uh, European. No. Okay. We're gonna start in two, three minutes, something like that. We're gonna start in two, three minutes, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Give me a second. Let me go. Um, give me a second. Let me go. Uh, right back. Okay. First, be right back. Okay. <laughs> I hope everybody enjoyed my little disquisition on, on Henry George. Pretty interesting guy. He's like the, the uh, pickety of his, di of his time, railing against inequality. But like I say, you know, I mean, it's kind of interesting. You look back at that period of, of history, um, I mean, there were plenty of intellectuals in the world that were not seeking universal prosperity, they were totally panicked by it. They were just in a meltdown state of, oh my God, what are we going to do? Everybody's getting getting rich and um, the masses are reproducing themselves and living ever longer and invading our cities and changing life. And this is this is terrible. This is a fundamental threat to uh, the ruling class. I mean, this is the same period in which eugenics was um, was hatched, you know, as a, as a solution to the so-called problem of universal prosperity. Mommy made it a few weeks so, ago. Mommy made it a few weeks ago. What? Oh. So, um, uh, so the point is that for whatever is wrong with Henry George, at least he aspired to, you know, 
too universal prostate. I mean, he actually like celebrated technological advance and um, uh, thought it was it was it was fabulous and, and wonderful. He just wanted to see it more broadly shared among the population. So I guess in that sense, he was kind of like a predecessor predecessor to the distributivists in a way, you know, in England. In fact, he was writing about the same time. Uh, but, but, you know, Stephen Murray wrote a ta an attack on Henry George on the land tax, because like even in the 1950s, right, among the American right wing, there was a huge popularity of this land tax idea. Oh, yeah. Rothbard has a great oh, yeah. attack on the, uh, um, the Georgians. Uh, yeah. So these guys were still these guys in the 1950s were were kind of a. We're, we're still hanging out, you know, like I, th I think Fee was filled with uh, kind of people that were influenced by Henry George, actually, in the 1950s. At some point, his influence just sort of weirdly died out. Um, but um, wow, back in the day, I mean, you think about it. I mean, you write a book and I think it came out in like 1879. And and still, you know, um, 70 years later, people are still reading it and being influenced by it. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> it know? is. It is. It's amazing. So that's why I'm reading it. Like, I want to find out, like, why was this book so compelling to so many people? And I don't think it's the economics, although he, he offers this kind of, like, silly, um, you know, silly model. I mean, he argues. Basically, he argues that that just like the socialists, right? That that capital is not productive. The only productive thing is labor. Um, that's uh, you know, so he's got a, you know a lot of crankish uh, views in there. But uh, I, I really I, t I tend to think that like like the reason the book has been so powerful is, is not really due to his economics, but rather to the to the moral vision that he has, which is which is extremely compelling. Uh, and and really, I mean, like the language is is beautiful. Um, also, he seems to offer an alternative to socialism. Okay, it's not capitalism really, or it is capitalism without. But it's hard to imagine like how does capitalism look without private ownership of land, right? That's a little weird. But um, but it's not socialism either. So uh, he seemed to offer like an alternative. Uh, to uh, I mean, it seems to me, it seems to me, it seems to me, it seems to me, like, like, we, we go from Locke, we go from Locke, to, to George, to, to George, socialism, to socialism. Uh, oh, that's a really interesting point. Yeah. Hey, so it's should I, we start talking about, um, IP. about <laughs> IP? Um, I, I, I kind of like to introduce the topic. Um, in a way, I guess we've got everybody here, right? And we're on and everything is good and we've got a lot of viewers, so we're, we're, we're good. But, um, so I would kind of like to introduce the topic by, well, specifically with reference, with reference to libertarians. Okay. So we could talk about IP in general and that's always fun, but we're especially interested in IP as it affects sort of the way libertarians think about the world. And that's especially interesting, right? So um, I have to say that um, like 10 years ago, um, if you stood up in front of a libertarian audience and said IP has to be is a, is a monopoly privilege granted by government and should be abolished, I think you would get a almost universal pushback from the audience. But now I stand up in front of audiences and say this all the time. And and I get almost universal agreement or kind of like, well, that's a very interesting view. I'll think about it. And the only time you ever get pushed back is from some 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 old guy in the back who's who has an AOL uh, dot com email address or something, you know. <laughs> um, so there's been a huge shift, I would say, in the liberty world on this topic. And I, I think it's. Uh, basically entirely attributable to to your to your book and to your essay um, against intellectual property. It's probably the single most transformatively influential monograph in liberty circles in the last 
30 years, I would say. I can't think of another single essay or document or book that that had such a fundamental effect and shifting people's views from one way to the other. Um, but it took, I would say, about 10 years for this to happen, but it really has happened. Uh, so uh, congratulations to you. Well, I, I appreciate that well, and I, I uh, appreciate that and I. Uh, but you, know, you and I have never talked about IP before. You know, this is the first time we've ever talked about this topic. So um, this will be a so groundbreaking topic be for us. Groundbreaking topic for us. Um, but um, I don't like to take credit for things I that, like for things that I think that I'm building I on that or that I'm you and I and others are building on. I honestly think that I the groundbreaking work for IP was, for IP was, I mean, Benjamin Tucker I mean, before, Benjamin us, before us, your namesake. I don't know if you're your related, to him. related to him. I'd be proud to if I were you. I don't know if you're proud to if I were you. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been tempted really to claim. To claim but it. I really think. To, to claim uh, uh, to succession claim, uh, from, uh, from uh, the Tucker. Right. Um, I think Wendy McElroy, yeah, Sam, Wendy Conkin, McElroy uh, Sam Conkin, George uh, Smith, George Smith, some of these earlier guys, uh, these really did guys, uh, really did the work that laid the groundwork laid the to, groundwork to make it clear to us to make it clear when to the us internet us came of age. When the internet came of age. And I think it is an increasingly important topic. It's becoming increasingly, it's become increasingly topic. clear that it's it is. Increasingly clear that it is. And the only way to see that is to have a solid foundation in property rights, in economic understanding. Economic understanding. You know, but I think intellectual you know, property has become one of the property has become one of the biggest threats to human prosperity. <laughs> to human prosperity in the modern age. I put it in the top four or five right now. Four or five right now. I'm getting pushback from some of our peeps who say that I'm echoing. Yeah, I think you're echoing. I think you have yeah, your, um, your, your speaker on. Uh, okay, hold on. Okay, that that probably fixes things, right? I think Does it that is. fix things. I hear no okay, echo. Good. Okay, so uh, let's just quickly talk about this. Um, uh, about about this this whole problem. Um, because within the libertarian world, and, and as you know, um, I'm reading Atlas Shrugged right now, right? That's right. So, yeah, so this, and, and, and obviously Rand was, um, well, let's just establish the fact that she is, you know, far and above the, I would say there's like no contest about, about this, that far and above the single most influential thinker in, in libertarianism, you know, ever. Um, you know, she, more than anybody else, I mean, I don't think anybody could ever dispute this, had more influence in, in shaping um, the way libertarians go about thinking about the world than, than anybody else. Other people are important, but, but she's, you know, just epically uh, huge, you know, for, for everybody uh, and continues to be. So what you get from this book is something very interesting. Um, 
she's a, she's advancing a different view. And as you know, I'm, you know, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm reading Progress and Poverty, the late 19th century. Everybody is asking this critical question in the history of political economy. What is the thing that creates wealth? You know, where does this, where does wealth come from? What is the central uh, uh, stuff that gives rise to wealth? So you have many different answers, right? So, um, you know, with Adam Smith, you have uh, uh, you know division of division of labor. You know, um, with 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 the socialists and Marx, you know, you have you know labor. Uh, Henry George, uh, you know, echoed this. It was it was labor, and then. Um, then with Bombarberg, you know, it's like capital in the Austrian tradition, so it's like you know, capital is the thing. Um, but this argument has gone on for a very long time. You know, people want to know what is the thing that gives rise to this great mystery that we're rising out of the state of nature. To what do we attribute this? You know, um, so I think if if like like Rand's massive contribution to this to this whole debate. Is that she argued, and I think you know at length, very successfully, through many nonfiction works and also fiction works and everything else, that that actually all of these physical things are a distraction. It's it's not really about about the sweat of your brow. It's not really about how much you know massive capital there is, or you know all these things are kind of important. But that the fundamental, most productive, most productive, and therefore most valuable social resource there is is um, ideas, right? That's, I, I mean, that seemed to be Rand's critical contribution uh, to uh, political economy, is that, that ideas are the thing. It's, it's intelligence, it's rationality, it's the application of, of, of ideas to the, to the world that, um, that, uh, that makes for great machines, it makes for, for wealth, and, and so, um, and and like I don't think that you and I really disagree with that, right? I mean, I'm I'm not sure what your position is on that, but I I think that sounds more or less right to me. Um, I mean, in fact, that's an an amazing insight, uh, and it kind of upends and you know the, the whole of, of political economy in a way, and gives us a new way to look at the world. Um, the the problem is that that uh, uh, it's 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 kind of not a big step. To go from the belief that ideas are the fundamentally most important productive unit in society to believe that therefore, um, you know, capitalistic style private property ownership should pertain to ideas, and if and if ideas are just commonly owned or looted by the world or otherwise not uh, not not protected and guarded and and, and titled. Then, then we're going to lose out on something extremely significant. You know, new inventions. Um, people are going to be uh, you know, immorally stolen from, disincentivized to create. Civilization could fall apart. It, do you see what I mean? It seems like that's that's the 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 wrong step that people take in the course of this. And it, and it seems like why she was, uh, you know, as it turns out, you know, not just a champion of of, of patents, copyrights, and trademarks, but that she believed that um, owning ideas was the single most important thing that any society could do in order to to be just and, and wealthy. Do you think do you think I'm right about that? Yes, I I I I I think I understand. Look, I think Ayn Rand made a huge mistake, and I think I understand why she made it. I think it's understandable. She was trying to identify as a philosopher, as a social theorist, what is the nature of man. Man is the rational animal. So we're different than other animals in that we use our reason. Okay, so she saw the crucial role of reason and ideas and information and intelligence in human prosperity. And of course, you can't disagree with that. Um, I think her mistake was uh, not seeing it as Mises did. Mises understood the difference between in human action, the role of ideas and information and the role of scarce means and, and resources. And Ayn Rand made a mistake, I think, which is uncharacteristic of her because normally she was very principled in her thinking, like, you know, antitrust law is wrong because a businessman 
has the right to set whatever price he wants to set, no matter what, no matter what the consequences. So she was sort of anti-consequentialist in those terms, minimum wage, uh, discrimination, racial discrimination, these, these issues. Okay, but when it comes to uh, the idea that the state should pass laws to make artificially scarce ideas so that they can be economized by the price system so that people have the right incentives to maximize the use of these ideas, this she became sort of like a utilitarian or a Chicago type economist, which is unlike her. And which is incompatible with the rest of her or her whole idea system. Um, so I think that she she went off track there. But I think the reason is, and if you go back to trace the history of this, we have been off base the entire history of humanity, basically, in understanding the role of scarcity, the role of property rights, the role of ideas. People have always confused these things, and it wasn't just Ayn Rand's fault alone or failure alone to clearly distinguish these things. It was all of humanity's up until the modern age and, and, and continuing until this day when intellectual property is at, at its zenith in a sense. I mean, intellectual property, patent and copyright in particular, are at doing their worst damage today as we speak, primarily because our age has become so technological and so idea oriented and so universal and so international with the internet, with the internet and communication. Uh, perversely, proponents of intellectual property say that now is the time when intellectual property is needed even more, right? Because we, we live in an age of ideas and uh, right. hyper competition and technology, because of that, now we need copyright and patent even more than ever. When the That's truth right. is that because of that, now the damage done by these laws is being seen more patently, you know, by everyone more visibly, more and more. That's why there's such controversy about these laws. So that yeah, they're less enforceable than ever. Um, uh, by the way, uh, when you said that, I was thinking about a book written by Michael Novak, you know, who's, who's a very interesting, you know, sort of neoconservative, you know, pro-capitalist thinker, um, still around. But it was written, um, I think it was about in the mid-1990s, and he talked about this being the age of ideas, that, that in the past, capital was all physical capital. Now we recognize that, that uh, we've, we've moved into a new age where the essential capital really was ideas. And so therefore, he said, uh, the most important thing we can do is have, have patents. And in fact, he attributed to the existence of patents um, uh, the the prosperity of, of the of the West, you know. And he actually like you know celebrated patents in the course of you know a series of chapters of, of this one book, which I think is called Free Persons in, in the I forget now the name of the, uh, of the book. So yeah, I mean this is a very common uh, view, and I think that um, objectivists, you know, over time began to uh, you know, adopt the same positions. Like, if if ideas are the most important thing, then then surely uh, it's more important that we have private property and ideas than than any any other institution. Well, I think their their mistake is the way they talk about things called, they call values. They use the, the term value is like a, a noun referring to an existing thing. So, and to me, here's where conceptual clarity becomes very important. Um, which Mises and other economists do better than Rand did in this field. Um, they think of a value as a thing that you can create existentially or ontologically, uh, and therefore the owner of that thing is the creator. That's the natural, the natural intuition. Um, the, the problem is this sort of uh, equivocation in the word wealth, like how do you create wealth? So I like the way Hans Hermann Hoppe phrases it. He talks about there are different ways of acquiring ownership of things in the world. You can homestead or appropriate an unowned or unused resource in the world, or you can acquire it by contract. Okay, that's a way to acquire ownership. But to acquire wealth, 
you know, what does wealth mean? Wealth means to increase the value of a thing, usually a thing that's already owned, because you have to own the thing, you have to be able to possess and control the thing, to manipulate it, to transform it, to produce something more valuable. So wealth really just means improving things that are already owned. And the wealth is the increased value of the already owned things. But if you understand that distinction, then you would never make the mistake of saying that I own this wealth because I improved the previous thing. That's actually not the case. As Hoppe emphasizes, you don't own wealth. Wealth is a subjective thing. That'd be like owning your reputation, or owning the value of a home, or owning the value of a rose garden that you can see from across the street. You can't own these kinds of values, just these subjective things. Ownership it has to be contained to the physical control of the physically uh, scarce material resources. Okay, and so. Property rights have to do with ownership and control of scarce material resources, things that we can have conflict over. Wealth arises from the ability to control these things and, and the ability and the creativeness used in manipulating them and making them more valuable to us uh, or to others. That is not a property rights uh, issue. This is why I believe, I know it's boring to some people or makes their eyes go you know, glassy-eyed, fuzzy, but praxeology, Mises' understanding of human action, which distinguishes between the use of means and the use of ideas to guide your control of these means. There are two different aspects of human action, and one of them has to do with property rights and law and ownership, and one of them does not, okay? And so the fundamental pro problem with intellectual property specifically patent and copyright, is that it tries to give property rights and ideas, information, knowledge. But in human action, what we do is we manipulate, we grapple with, we control scarce resources. We do it by choice. The choice is guided by our information, our intelligence, our knowledge. You have to own the resource to control it, to keep it uh, free from manipulation by someone else. But the ideas that you're guided by can be freely shared because information can be distributed, learned, transmitted, communicated, copied forever and ever unto infinity. So there's a and fundamental remixed. distinction. And remixed and yes, and used and transformed, etc. Uh, uh, okay, but um, can I just go back to your, your this notion of conflict because it becomes extremely important. It's like you're saying if there's not a conflict, uh, then there's no reason. If there's not a conflict, then there's no reason for for allocation of, of ownership rights. Um, well, the, but yeah, right. go ahead, go ahead. Well, the entire purpose of property rights is to is to specify which of two or more competing claimants to a given resource has the right to use it. That that entire endeavor only makes sense if there's a possibility of conflict in the first place. If we lived in a world in which we were all gods or we all had infinite power or no conflict was possible, the entire idea of social norms and property rights would make no sense whatsoever. It would have no use. It would never arise. It arises only because of this social problem that we live in a world of scarcity and that only someone can use this desired resource in a certain way, and either people physically fight over it, and there's always conflict and war, or we seek to find a social mechanism, a socially respected way of assigning who gets to use the resource so that they, the resources can be used peacefully and cooperatively without conflict. So conflict okay. is actually essential to property rights. Yeah, okay, but uh, I think your your use of the term pure physical is extremely important because, I mean, there's, uh, because using other people's ideas is going to give rise to conflict. I mean, um, you know, if I had an idea of opening up a donut shop here in town and then some, sh then it becomes very profitable and some other guy opens up another donut shop, you know, uh, down the street, 
um, and charges less than me, that's going to uh, I'm going to perceive that as a as a conflict. I mean, I have I have a problem with this guy. Um, he, you know, I had the idea first. He's uh, clearly just copied my idea. Um, uh, you know, that gives rise to certain conflicts. I mean, uh, you know, if if, uh, if Hank Reardon's making Reardon steal, and somebody else steals his 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 uh, his his method of production and creates beard and steel, uh, he's going to have a problem with that guy, right? I mean, so um, it's not as if it's not as if there there aren't conflicts in in the world of I- of ideas. So what 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 do you what do you mean when you say there's 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 no conflicts because because there are conflicts, right? So I think this is where we have to. Um... This is where the notion of conflict uh, helps to uh, clarify the whole idea of property rights. Um, when we have a conflict, then we can ask, ask what the conflict over, and that helps identify the boundaries of the property in dispute. So as an example, um, it's commonly said in loose language that you know people can fight over religion, for example. But that's actually not true. What people fight over always is physical things, bodies, land, animals, you know, material resources. So, for example, if a Christian or a Muslim or a, I don't know, let's pick a neutral religion, the, the, a Buddhist, <laughs> a Buddhist wants to force someone to become a Buddhist, they might do it by threatening to kill the Christian if they don't convert to Buddhism. But in that case, the conflict is said to be a conflict over religion, but in reality, the conflict is over the resource that the people are actually disagreeing about the use of, which is the body of the Christian who's going to be killed. Yeah. Yeah. So so what people do is they're confusing motive in the law. This is called motive or purpose, right? In other words, why are you trying to stab… A sword into, or a spear into my body. That's the motive. But the thing you're doing is what's objected to, which is stabbing a spear into my body, right? So the thing that's objected to is invading the borders of my body. If if someone said, um, I'm going to convert you to my religion, and if you don't agree, I'm going to really be upset about it, okay? They're not going to stab you. They're not going to invade you. They're not going to burn your fields down. They're not going to take your women and your children and kill your animals. If they didn't do anything physical, there would really be no dispute worthy of mentioning. It would just be a battle of words, and that's fine. The only time this really becomes a dispute in human life is when there's a real physical conflict over actual, usable, what Mises would call scarce means of action. Which you and mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. have written about in our, in our in right. Our memes. So ideas, ideas are not scarce. So yeah. So uh, if somebody steals my idea, uh, that might annoy me. It it might um, you know cause me to uh, to to to, uh, to compose a tweet. You know that's sort of a nasty tweet or whatever. Um, I I might uh, I might denounce the person. Uh, but 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 in fact, it gives no rise to a, a physical conflict over any existing resource that's in dispute. Not any more than um, um, look. We have to be careful not to use English language and possessive pronouns as a substitute for argumentation. So if I can call something my idea, or my wife, or my store, or my customer, just because I can use the word my like a possessive noun, possessive pronoun. No. Doesn't doesn't yeah. mean there's a, a legal claim to it. Um, if you would open the door to say that um, this kind of harm, so-called harm, is upsetting me in this kind of way, is a legally recognizable claim, then there's no reason why you couldn't um, say that my competing with you in the free market and stealing your so-called customers, why that's not also a claim. So, in other words, if you understand that there's nothing, you have no proprietary interest in your customers, you have no proprietary interest in your girlfriend being your girlfriend, then just because someone could describe 
the competition that happens with the word theft or steal, like this guy stole my girlfriend, this guy stole my customers, this guy harmed me by competing with me. These kinds of words don't really substitute for a clear analysis of any kind of claim at all. I mean, there's nothing wrong with stealing someone's girlfriend in a legal sense, right? If I woo someone instead of her, that's fine. If I get your customers because I'm a, I, I satisfy them better, that's fine. If Burger King takes some of McDonald's customers, they didn't suffer. They might have harmed McDonald's, but they didn't take anything from McDonald's that McDonald's owned. And that's the fundamental mm. question, ownership. Okay, yeah. and this is what people lose sight of. They want to focus on these vague terms like harm and cost and imposing. Um, you have to ask, where's the conflict? What's the resource? Who has the better claim to it? Who's controlling it? And who invaded the borders of it? And that's it. Um, but you can understand um, <clears throat> the... Um the intuition that people have, uh, uh, which is something that's a little bit, a little bit interesting. It's like um, first movers in the marketplace uh, very much feel as if they have a proprietary interest in maintaining, you know, a kind of monopoly over the set of uh, the body of ideas that, that led um, to whatever kind of innovation uh, uh, they uh, they gave rise to, right? And you can you can sort of understand that that intuition a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if that's because we have laws concerning it, or if it's really sort of intrinsic to our way of thinking about the world. But um, I, I, but I, there I, is. I, that sense. Yeah, I, I honestly I can't understand it that well. Even though I'm a patent attorney and I'm used to this way of thinking, I just I don't quite understand that way of thinking. I think it arises because of a primitive understanding of economics, and that is most normal people understand that there's a harmony of interest between uh, economic reasoning and justice, right? So they understand that, you know, there's a reason to have property rights in land and cars and factories and things like that. And then they also start to see that there is an unnatural incentive effect, like whoever marshals these resources better and uses them better is going to make, might make a profit. They could capture the profit because of the, the free market system. So people start associating the idea that whatever law could produce an incentive to produce a desired result is consonant with justice. I think that's what people think. And I think that's wrong, but that's what people think. So they get used to the idea of the commodification of things that can be sold in contractual terms like ideas or information or intellectual creations partly because we have patent and copyright law already and it's ingrained into the system of, of western capitalism i think that that's true so, i think that's really true we've been shaped in many ways by the existence of or of what we believe uh, is is the way the system currently works, right? And so, yeah, that's part of our of our apparatus of of thinking about political economy. You know, it just so, so they, the they connect they, they they connect incentives to property rights. So whatever they yeah. think of as being the incentive system, they think that has to be part of the property rights apparatus that has to exist, and they they don't go further than that because they they can't conceive of any other. Um, alternative systems because they're used to it because we have patent copyright now. You know, if you ask them about perfumes and uh, uh, fashion designs, they they freak out and they stutter and they have no answer because that's right because perfumes 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 can uh, can be freely copied. Actually, you know, it's it's interesting when you think about just the sheer number of products out there that uh, that are are copied. You know that that there's not a, a, a brand name attached to, but there's an exact copy of them. I, I was just at um, CVS today buying, you know, basic household products. And for almost everything, there's there's like a famous brand name. Uh, I forget now what it was I, I, I was buying now today, but there was a, 
a, like a famous brand name. Um, and then there was the CVS version of the, ex of the, the exact same thing. That's like, like almost half a price, right? Yes. And, and they're right yes. on the shelf right next to each other, you know? Um, okay, the fact that they continue to exist and thrive means that, you know, both are, are, are profitable. And it's, it's very obvious that the brand name has this gigantic markup over, you know, over what must be its, its cost of production. Um, but people continue to, to buy it just because they just, for whatever reason, you know, associate some psychological sense of trust, you know, with, with, the, with the brand name product. Yeah, and this happens with, um, so I, I, with drugs, like Tylenol versus acetaminophen or yeah. you know, Motrin versus ibuprofen. Um, it's across the board. I mean, even cleaning and, products. Yeah, it, it happens all like, the time. Yeah, like, uh, you know, Mr. C Mr. Clean's, you know, whatever, um, you know, bleach spray or whatever, compared to the exact same product of CVS, which is like right next to it on the shelf. It's, so, the, which is an interesting thing that I think a lot of times you talk about conflict. And, and how property rights only pertain when there's actual conflict. Um, there's also a sense that uh, uh, people have that if you permit, you know, um, widespread sharing of ideas, that that there can only be one winner in the space, you know? Um, right. So if I come up with a, a, a new kind of suitcase that's amazing and everybody steals my idea that somehow I'm going to be robbed of my own profitability, but but actually the real world shows that that's that's really not true. I mean, you can continue to uh, become the most profitable uh, brand name in a space for like a hundred years, you know, um, while while there's massive competition uh, in in offering the same product that you offer at a much lower price. I mean, there's there's a weird element of rationalism um, associated with the with the pro IP uh, position. And they just imagine that this is not true, uh, that you can't have, you know, multiple winners from a single idea. There can only be one real winner, you know? Absolutely. I mean, I mean well, the real world shows just the opposite. Well, yeah, I mean, you can think of Coca-Cola, McDonald's, companies that have survived for a long time, even though they're really making fairly generic hamburger cold, you know? And yet they find a way to prosper. Right. And the hey, you're doing something to your microphone, uh, Stefan. You're doing something to your microphone. It's like, yeah, it's it, it was rubbing against something there. Right now. No, no, it's suddenly all muddy. Uh, all right, hold on. Oh, there we go. Now it's fixed. Is it better? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. No, that's that's all right. It's all right. No, no. Well, you and I were talking about Ayn Rand earlier and how. Uh, well, I, I've come to believe that the Fountainhead was uh, kind of a an IP terrorism article, a novel, right? It's about a guy destroying a private property project which he had no contractual claim to because he didn't like how they how they used his ideas. So I think the Fountainhead, surprisingly, although it inspired me, I'm not sure why it's a libertarian novel. I can't figure that one out. At the Shrug, it's much better. But even that has these sort of um, parts where Ayn Rand's own views of IP fall apart. And you and I were talking about that the other day, right? Like about how uh, I'm fascinated by this. I'm, 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 I'm right now. I'm, I'm, I'm almost halfway through it, and um, I'm really in, like constantly intrigued uh, by the conflict between the government and and Hank and Hank Reardon, right? Uh, because uh, because the government wants his his steel, you know, and and you know, there's various coercive measures that he has to um, produce a certain amount at a certain a certain uh, certain price that you know they want his, his, his formulas. They want uh, uh, Reardon steel, you know, uh, for their own purposes. But it's 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 always a little bit vague in the in the text like what does this wanting the steel you know consist of right is it um you know relinquishing his patents which i guess that's ultimately what it what it comes down to right the patents that well, the government it's, itself it's, has granted it's, it's never quite clear i don't know if ayn Rand understood patents or if she covered up what it was because she sensed that it she could never make a clear case 
that this was yeah. unjust. I mean, the government is granting a monopoly, and they forced Reardon to publicize the details in the patent. So right. I'm not sure what the government was getting. Did they, they didn't get the knowledge because it was already public in the patent. Right, everybody knows that. Right. And the government okay. actually, as I told you, the government has the right under the patent system to grant what's called a compulsory license to any patent the government grants. So the government right. could just easily make whatever is covered by a patent and then pay some kind of you know minor payment to the to the patent holder. Or they could even grant a license to a third party, which was threatened in the Cipro case in the anthrax uh, scare about 14, 14 years oh, ago, yeah. by the way. This happens all the time. Yeah. Um, so it's, it makes no sense in Atlas for that. And there's other cases in Atlas where um, she has Dagny and Hank hiring a, a scientist to try to reverse engineer Galt's, engine, Galt's uh, motor. Right, which would be a, some kind of trade secret or patent violation in her ideal world, and then and there's yet, the other that's, case that's that's never even brought up, right? I mean, it's just seen to be an illustration of Dagny's own brilliance that that yeah, she and, sees. Well, there's, there, there's there's nothing seen as wrong about them trying to do that, right? They're trying to learn from <laughs> someone else, which is what competition is. And then there's also the case. I mean, in the end, Judge Narragansett. You haven't gotten here yet, but Judge Narragansett and Galt's Gulch. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but this brilliant well, legal genius, Aristotle plus Galt squared. He basically takes the U.S. Constitution and he he fixes it by crossing out the bad parts and adding to the good parts and you know, whatever. Yeah. But that's that's remixing, right? I mean, that's just taking an existing work. If there was a copyright on the U.S. Constitution. He wouldn't be able to draft the <laughs> ultimate constitution for Galt's Gulch and anarchy and liberty or whatever. I mean, there's so many examples where reality butts heads with her conception of intellectual that's, property. Also, the, that's, the part where that's really funny. And there's the guy, the guy that listens to. Um, he hears the guy whistling the un, unfinished concerto of Haley or something like that on the train. Robbery, yeah. Yeah, well, there's also, there's also the um, um, there's there's also the, the I mean it struck me immediately about about the matter of trademark, you know when uh, Dagny names her new line the John Galt line, right? Oh right, um, right, right, right. Yeah, I, mean, I never knew that before. She, you mentioned that to me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, she had no obligation to find out if this is a, a real, you know, person who maybe has a claim to his name. Yeah. I mean, she's just going to steal golf, somebody's name and attach it. Or something. Golf, and, and, golf, and it's and it's, and it's, pre and it's presented as a kind of a tribute. Actually, she's tired of everybody saying, you know, who's John Galt? She's sick of that phrase. She finds it excessively cynical and too bitter. So she's trying to reverse, you know, the public image of of John Galt, you know, uh, and naming her line this. But there's no sense that. Oh my God! You're actually stealing somebody's identity here, you know. Well, in other words, just... uh, go ahead. Well, um, so quite often in the book, the impulse to copy is is seen as a sign of of brilliance, you know, not as evidence of theft. Right. Right. Well, because it's natural. It's normal. Yeah. Of course. So she sees that. No, what I was going to say is there's a, there's a scene later where Dagny becomes his housemaid, basically, and he pays her like a, a silver dollar or a silver coin or a gold coin, and she's so happy she got paid, you know, an honest piece of money for an honest week's work or something. But That's right. But actually, he should have charged her for stealing his trademark on the golf school line, you know, <laughs> if he was being consistent. Yeah. You, you owe know, me a million so, dollars for stealing my IP. It's so it's so unfair for us, you know, sixty years later or whatever it is, for us to take apart this book, you know, on you know, in light of IP theory, because you you get what she's doing, right? She's making the very important case that ideas are the single most productive unit in society because ideas are more valuable than anything else, which I I think it's, it's true. And also, she's against um, looting governments to steal people's stuff, you know. And yes. she makes this sweeping and beautiful, uh, elegant case. It's just that these two sort of important notions get all kind of tangled together, you know. 
in the course of the plot and in the course of her own narrative. And like I say, it's it's un uh, it's unfair to us to to do this to to yes uh, yeah it, it is I, like to that. agree. I, I I would say the Fountainhead is more mired in this stuff, so it's more subject to criticism. And I'm not really trying to criticize Atlas. What I'm trying to show is that Ayn Rand and a lot of libertarians and Lockeans are wrong about IP. And what I'm trying to show is that they're wrong because it's not comp it's not consistent. You cannot be consistently for IP. And Ayn Rand right. herself was and, and Atlas Shrugged, which was a really good novel. Even even that novel illustrates why she was wrong about IP. Um, I'm not criticizing the novel. I'm saying she's wrong about IP, and that was one of her two major mistakes. Her her other major mistake was being in favor of the state, of course. Which even Atlas also debunks that because the, the you know the ideal community illustrated near the end is Galt Skelch, which is a quasi. I think it's an anarchist society, basically. So, sure, and it sounds uh, like they're, 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 the the constitution that they that they looted from uh, from from Madison's uh, proper intellectual property <laughs> was just really a social contract, not really a government. Yeah, so they violated I, I don't, IP. Not, yeah. They don't respect the government or the state, and they violated IP in the in, in the good parts of the novel. So I think she's actually on her instincts are right. <laughs> When she writes on these yeah. topics, she's wrong. But it's, this isn't about Ayn Rand, but that's just you know an example of that. Hey, just Stefan, I and we're and we're we're we only have 15 minutes left, but I really do want to. There's a couple of things I want to say, and I, I'll just say them in su uh, quick succession here, so we can comment about them. <clears throat> the first one, uh, okay, I'm going to reverse them. Uh, the first one concerns Locke. Uh, I think since you wrote this monograph, you've under you've come to understand. Uh, the problems that 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 you know emanate from Locke's basically you know labor theory of production. Um, uh, I I mean that was a revelation for me. I now understood that Locke was actually terrible on property rights, and that's like the worst thing that happened to uh, Scottish Enlightenment you know tradition, and 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 thereby U.S. libertarianism to have celebrated Locke's theory of property. Because it's gotten us all, you know, enormously confused. I, I find nothing redeeming about it whatsoever, whatsoever, especially in light of, you know, much superior theory offered by Mises um, and 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 Hoppe, Benjamin Tucker, and others. Uh, so there's that. Okay, so just keep that in mind. The second thing I want to say is that your monograph is only ostensibly about the problems of copyright, patent, and intellectual property generally. That's like its first level um, insight. But for me personally, intellectually, uh, once you dispense with the need for legally created monopolies over ideas, then you understand something like really extremely important about the role of ideas in history, that, um, that they really are a communistically owned, so, so socialistically distributed uh, factor of production. Um, and you know, g g having that insight uh, I think does fundam fundamentally changes something about the the our capitalistic way of of of, of thinking about the market. At least for me personally, it, it upended a lot of a lot of my notions of what, about uh, uh, about capitalism and the function of the social order generally. So it opened up a whole sphere that gives new levity and meaning to the work of Hayek in particular, but it also illustrates that Hayek. As, as great as he was on these topics, really did not go far enough. Uh, that that uh, that that ideas, uh, the, the non ownership of ideas themselves, is a is a kind of an amazing way to understand you know, essentially how the world works. So I mean, I, I don't think you, your monograph just makes a case against IP. It makes a case for a new social theory. Um, at least for me, that's that's how important it is, and I don't think you intended to do that, but I think that's the effect of it. Well, I, I think that no one prior to about 10, 15 years ago really gave these ideas enough attention, and that's because they they didn't seem to be that important, right? Um, um, I I do think there's a, the mistake we talked about earlier has been made even by free market advocates, right? This kind of incentive idea, this communist idea. Like we, we sort of forget why we're opposed to communism. 
we're, we're opposed to communism because communism ignores the nature of reality and it forgets the fact that there are limited scarce resources that we need to economize and that we need to use and that property rights and capitalism is the way to do that that's what communism forgets right but in our zeal to argue the case for capitalism and to oppose communism we start thinking there's something wrong with a world where there would be free ownership or good ownership of lots of things if we had that kind of world the land of cocaine you know hans calls it or the land of milk and honey that would actually be a good thing we don't have that in the land of scarce resources but if we understand the distinction between ideas and scarce means and how they play different roles in human action ideas are things that everyone can have at the same time and we can teach each other we can learn from each other we can compete with each other we can observe each other and we can emulate remix and do everything with these ideas we still have the constraints of scarcity on the scarce means property rights are necessary and good for the scarce means but they are destructive they have to be. for the things yeah. that can be copied it, it makes no sense to do that so communism meaning universal ownership of things if they could be universally owned is not a bad idea the reason communism is bad in the physical realm is that things cannot be universally owned and that if you don't have property rights things can't be used productively and peacefully right but in the realm of ideas and knowledge and information they actually can be so in a sense i agree with you communism if you apply it in that sense to ideas is a good thing because it doesn't it doesn't not make sense it actually does make sense in that in that realm so but that's let me, I let me ask you something oh is, but, you know uh, i've never really asked you this question before but I mean, once you begin to think about property rights in the way that you're stating it right now, don't you think that it it affects sort of the moral status or the moral standing of the notion of of private property? Like, like I think that it's been fairly typical uh, in in libertarian in the libertarian world and liberty minded circles and classical liberalism itself to regard uh, property rights as as Kind of an extension of of human ethics, you know that it yeah. like it, um, it's a fundamental ethical postulate, you know that 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 must stay alive in the world, or else, you know, we perish in some way. Um, so look, it's written in the Ten Commandments, you know. But there's a sense in which it's in, and if even Rothbard writes like this, you know, that it's that it's an extension of natural law. Um, that it's you know it's it's a, a an ethical postulate that's somehow enshrined on our in our hearts as human beings. I mean, you're describing property rights as well. I mean, let's just face it; it it sounds completely utilitarian. I mean, that that it's like a social construction that we made up in order to to achieve greater um, uh, you know, gains from trade and 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 wealth generally. I mean, do you do you agree with that? And do you understand? Do you do you understand the implications of what you're saying for a broader uh, moral outlook of of uh, the, the the issue of human liberty generally? I mean, as much as I can. I mean, I would say that it's it's consequentialist in a sense, not utilitarian. Uh, Randy Barnett does a good job in his introduction to his uh, structure of liberty and another essay has um, uh, on his website. Um, trying to distinguish between consequentialism and utilitarianism. I think utilitarianism is inherently uh, incoherent for basically Austrian reasons. Um, consequentialism, I don't think broadly stated is incoherent and I don't think it's incompatible with the natural law uh, viewpoint. Um, I've never thought there was an incompatibility. Uh, I mean, Ayn Rand herself said, you know, the, the practical is the moral and vice versa. And I think there's a truth to that. The reason that mm. we view these things as ethical rules and they get ingrained in human society is because they tend to practically involve good consequences. Um, I don't see there's any consequence, uh, and, and sorry, any, any, any in, incompatibility between uh, those approaches. And in any case, 
no matter what your grounding for property rights is or ethics is, you just cannot deny that the nature of property rights is to specify a rule for the exclusive control or ownership of a given ink, uh, scarce resource. And a scarce resource basically is a resource that there could be conflict over the use of. So mm -hmm. the, the very nature of property rights, no matter what your grounding for it is, even if it's completely natural law, natural rights oriented, is a rule that ends up specifying who gets to control a given resource. And the natural law view is that the owner of that resource ought to be the person with the more just claim to that resource. Okay, so there's really very little disagreement in the in the fundamental framing of the issue between natural law theorists and consequentialists. We all agree that there are scarce resources. If we're going to have use of them in a productive, peaceful way, there needs to be a property system that everyone, by and large, respects that specifies the owners of these resources. Pretty much no one disagrees with this. Even communists don't disagree with this. Everyone agrees with this. So then the only question is, the only question is, okay, who then is the just owner of the resource? So then we come to the normative question, which is, well, the normative answer has to relate to the function of the property rights in the first place, which is to permit resources to be utilized when they're unowned, and to be used in uh, in peace without being dispossessed by someone else. So all these things imply certain things that Locke himself did see in Glimmers and other people have seen in other ways, uh, and which ultimately, if you have a little bit of economic literacy, and a little bit of logic consistency, and you keep your terms straight, and you don't engage in equivocation, and you're honest, and you're consistent, it results in the libertarian framework, which is that basically when we see a resource that is disputed by two or more people, the person ought to have it and ought to be recognized as the owner of it. And that is the person that had the earlier claim to it or that obtained it by contract from some previous owner. It's really very simple. It's even simpler than Epstein's uh, simple, six simple rules for a complex yeah, world. But, but by the way, I don't even. I'm not even sure. I I accept your claim that you know earlier uh, is 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 uh, justice because that that opens up a real can of worms actually. Um, well, but, but you have to have anyway. first. The resource has to be used first somehow. So that's the point. So, in other words, there has to be a way for someone to be able to use a resource that's unowned and to pluck it out of the state of nature. But if you can Which be, if you use it and and you lose it, then um, I don't I don't know. I mean I I, I think there's a there's a real problems associated with. I mean for one thing, you know any rule about property that establishes the need for a third third party to adjudicate what is just and unjust implies the need for for you know mediation and and potentially a state. So I I far prefer Mises' view that basically if you can defend it, it's yours. Uh, I think that's a much better uh, uh, perspective than the Lockean uh, homesteading principle, but anyway, that's that's neither here nor there. And, and so you asked also about, say, so, I mean, Lock. I agree, Locke's Locke's views on labor are problematic, but given what he was fighting against, Filmer and the uh, you know the monarchical ideas, um, I think he was trying to use the existing constructs of the time, which was this religious idea that God created the world, God gave the earth to Adam and Eve, and he said, okay, let's start with that concept. And if we start with that concept, we can still arrive at kind of a proto-libertarian view of things. But the problem is he had to introduce this labor idea, which is the idea that you own yourself, which is a vague notion, and therefore you own your your labor, what you do with yourself or your actions, whatever that means. I really have never understood what anyone means by saying you own your actions or you own your labor. And therefore you have the best claim to own 
these unowned resources in the world that you mix your labor with. And he has a complicated set of arguments. He was trying to overcome another convoluted set of arguments by Philemon and others. So I don't blame Locke at all, but I do think it's it's it goes down a rabbit hole. And it, I do think this labor idea of Locke, which blends into this dessert idea, that you deserve to profit from your labor, leads to the labor theory of value and the labor theory of property of Locke. Um, so I do think that Locke's original conception has led to a lot of confusion and problems and has led directly to intellectual property. And uh, ultimately, we need to reject that to to get this stuff straight. Uh, there's a couple of questions because we're running up right up against the hour here. Uh, the first the first one is from Ken, um, who, by the way, uh, disagrees with me that Dagny was uh, violating trademark by calling her line the, the John Galt line because because uh, she did not, you know, for all she knew, Galt was dead and there was no patent owner around, so so therefore uh, it was available for her. But anyway, the the point that I was trying to make is that she didn't even, she didn't bother to find out, right? I mean, you know, it's just but yeah, and, and anyway, wasn't, he asked. Wasn't dead. God bless him. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm I'm binge reading it now. Does this, does this happen to everybody? Like it's been slow going for me, but now I just you know I'm binge reading. It's bad. I don't know. Most so. people I know have read it. They read it when they were young and they just devoured it. So uh, yeah, I'm just I, I I'm embarrassed to say that, that I have at your at your advanced age. <laughs> but it's I'm I'm actually like it was tough. It was a tough slog at first. I was like, oh god, I can't think. But but now it's 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 kind of exciting, and I'm I'm starting to like Dagny, and you know, so the, all the good things are happening. So it's 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 good. It's getting groovy for me. But anyway, Ken asks, uh, is it illegal, uh, Mr. Contella? Is it illegal for a person to make their own copy of a patented product and use it for their own use without paying anything to the patent owner? I mean, yes. You, you want yes. to go ahead and answer that? Yeah. Well, it's not illegal, but th there's there's a it's an infringement. Put it that way, which means there's there's a damages can be can be owed. Yeah. So the patent, the patent basically makes it um, an infringement to make, use, sell, or import, or offer to sell. That's what the patent right is. Make, use, sell, offer to sell, or import anything that's covered by a claim of patent, whether you're aware of it or not. It has nothing to do with your knowledge. So if you make something, or use it, or sell it, that happens to be close enough to the claims in some issued and existing and enforced patent, then yes, you're infringing the patent and you can be sued for damages. That's the way the patent And if you works. don't if you don't sell it, uh, then what? It doesn't, you're still doesn't making, matter. You, okay. You're making or using it. So you still you still have to owe dam you have to pay damages. Okay. Um, okay, so next or sell it. Okay, another question. I contribute to antiwar.com because producing the site requires a lot of work. I value my opportunity to consume the product, and I also value the opportunity of others to consume it. Otherwise, I wouldn't contribute. If we agree that the product is not property because it is not scarce, does this uh, agreement imply that I should not pay for it? Or, or um, I think we get the uh, the point. If we agree the product is not property because it's not scarce, uh, 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 does this mean I shouldn't pay for it, or even that a community a community's legal system should not penalize for for paying for it. You know, I um, uh, I'd like you to answer this, but I, I I think that this gets us into a a very interesting issue that we haven't talked about at all tonight, which is this relationship between remunerative services or remunerative products and and IP. I mean, neither you nor I are proposing that people not try to figure out ways to make money from their ideas. Neither of us are suggesting that, right? Absolutely not. I mean, um, but what I do oppose is the idea that just because it doesn't automatically occur to you to some entrepreneur or some would-be entrepreneur or some would-be actor in the market or in society, how they could get financially compensated for something they want to engage in or think they could engage in, it's something. If, just because they haven't come up with a business model or a way to do that, doesn't mean right. that the answer is that the government, the state, should come in and impose an anti-competitive monopoly that just legally prohibits competitors. Um, 
I mean, I hate to keep going back to the simple example, but um, you know, movie theaters have people that they pay to sell tickets and to watch the doors, and they have doors installed so that people can't come into the movie theater unless they pay. This is a cost in economics. It's called a cost of exclusion, and different businesses have come up with ways to efficiently exclude these kinds of costs so that they exclude free riders so they can make a profit. This is just part, one little tiny aspect of the entire business endeavor. But I don't think it's special. It's not asserting IP. You could, you could have the same kind of movie theater situation in the absence of IP, and basically the IP of movies is unenforceable anyway. Anybody can pop open their laptop and watch virtually anything these days. Yeah, and, yeah. and they and they, and, and they did are and they do. profitable. Well, in the in the early days, you know, there was the free rider problem with the uh, the drive-ins. Okay, so people would just park on the hills and they would watch the movies for free because there were big screens open to the public and there were loudspeakers behind the screens. So the movie theaters started putting these little speakers on these little poles next to every car that would drive into the drive-in movie. That's why they did that. So that was a cost of exclusion. It cost them something. It probably changed the experience, but it worked for a while. And nowadays, it's it's almost probably inconceivable what people do in response to practical realities. But you know, movie movie producing companies they show the movies on 3D screens and big movie theaters. They have early screenings for extra you know extra fees. They they put them on airplanes next. They put them in movies and. Uh, they, they sell them on iTunes at a high rate, then they rent them later, then they put them on Netflix, then they put them on HBO, whatever. They have many streams of income, and they have ways of dealing with this problem, even though there's pirating going on at the same time. That's this right. is just reality. Yeah, and some, I mean, what's, in some what's sense… What's the solution to, to, to execute people for, for pirating content? It's, it's, it's not right. it's in any way the, the, libertarian. There's there's a way in which and I think you and I have talked about this like as important and gigantically important intellectually the the IP issue is and it has very terrible patents have terrible effects on the world. Um, in the end, I mean ideas, you know, as as people say, you know, want to be free. You know, I mean, there's there's a trajectory uh, towards um, towards piracy. Um, uh, I mean, if, if, if iTunes hadn't figured out a good way to organize people's um, uh, songs in a library and a, an efficient download system and, and made it incentivize people to actually pay for some service they were offering, um, uh, you know, they never could have made money because, because the song itself uh, has, has essentially a zero price in the, in the world of the Internet. It's the services that are that people are charging from, and this is a linguistic confusion. People get confused. It's like I will buy that that book from Amazon. Oh, did you buy the ebook or you buy the physical book? Well, I went ahead and bought the ebook. Well, you're actually not buying an ebook. No, uh, and the ebook under, itself is under current law. Under current law, if you get an ebook or an, or you buy you quote unquote buy a song from iTunes. You actually only have some kind of limited license to it. You actually don't own it like you would own the CD or the vinyl album or the DVD of a movie oh. uh, in under the older law. So you're not actually even buying it, even under current positive um, positive law. I, look, I think that the thing is that the IP mentality and the IP system is entrenched. It's not going to go away anytime soon, just like the state. Um, so when people say, what can you do, uh, you can't stop the system, but, and I'm not advocating uh, you know, illegal activity, piracy, all that, that's an individual decision. However, you, know, you can release your work, Creative Commons. You can go to a publisher that doesn't force you to uh, lock up the copyright. You can try to encourage your employer or go to a company that has a better patent policy on ideas. There are actually things we can do in our daily lives. You can try to be open. You can try to not use the state's monopoly 
uh, against uh, competition and ideas. Oh, listen, yeah, I have to just tell you, Stefan, from my own point of view, when I look back at, at uh, everything I've written, um, if I had not published most of what I've written in the comments, you know, if, I, if it hadn't been a policy of the publishers for whom I wrote, uh, I would be in serious, serious trouble today. You know, I mean, okay. it's you, just you, you such could be sued a, by your previous publisher. You'd be you you'd be yeah. actually restricting yourself. Your earlier self would be restricting your future self from using what you had already built on and learned. That's right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I've I've been actually very insistent on on this with every institution that I've that I've worked for or, or published for. Like that's the the first thing I do is say, listen, we have to deal with this problem of of, of copyright here. It is not helping you. It's actually hurting you. And devaluing our authors' contributions, uh, and and I've been successful actually in three or even four separate times, and in, in bringing about this this policy of the Commons, and it's been, you know, it's been a lifesaver for me. I mean, the idea that that I, I would have to basically start over as a as a thinker, intellectual writer, you know, with every new institution that I'm working for or contracting with. Is is absolutely terrifying. It's a violation of my human rights, essentially. So absolutely. authors need to think um, about this. Yeah. Well, you know, and people say, well, I want to publish with an academic press or whatever for prestige. You know, Bolger and Levine, who wrote the great Against Intellectual Monopoly, a book that influenced you and me both, they published that book with Cambridge University Press, and they actually made a deal with them that. Uh, Cambridge would allow them to put a free PDF version of the book online, and it's still online on their site yeah. right now. It's called against againstmonopoly.org, I believe. Um, so yeah. if you just push, if you just ask and push for it, you can make deals and you can liberate the work that you're trying to spread to humanity instead of li shackling it with copyright. You know, spread it. This is, this, this, I don't understand. This is one of the great these books that, Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, but. I mean, people commonly think that copyright is all about the rights of the authors. Like, it's not only untrue, it's quite often in reality the opposite of the truth. It's the writers themselves who are most exploited by the practical implementation of copyright. Uh, wow, Stefan has gone away. Uh, Stefan got sick of me. Or something. Well, let's just wait one second here uh, while we see if he comes back. We've gone over time, and and to tell you the truth, that um, I mean, Stefan and I could sit around here and talk about this until midnight. So it's probably a good idea for for us to call it anyway. I'll give it just one quick second to see if he comes back. Okay, it's not happening. So uh, thank you all for being here. Um, it's a it's a fascinating topic. We just uh, uh, touched the surface of it. Um, on liberty.me, you can download uh, uh, Kinsella's monograph against intellectual property. I guess is the name of it. Um, a wonderful and epic epic uh, book. It changed changed me. You know, I, I read it for the first time. I thought it was crazy. It took me fully six years to come around to his argument, um, and I'm still just not not uh, stop thinking about it because it's, it's, it's so utterly fascinating. Thank you again for joining me on Sunday night. Um, I'm sorry I've missed the last couple of weeks when traveling. I think I've got a better schedule coming up. So I'll be here with you every Sunday night um, over the over the coming weeks. And let's talk about uh, some other cool books. I'm thinking about introducing into the series some, some different works. I, I, you know, I want to talk about Benjamin Constant's um, Liberty of the Ancients compared with that of the, mar uh, of the Moderns, which is a, a monograph that I'm obsessing about. Right now, I'm reading um, Progress and Poverty by Henry George, which is just incredibly fascinating a book, just for its, its widespread influence. I mean, you know, for 70 years, epic, amazing. I can't believe I've never read it. Uh, another book I'd, I'd kind of like to talk about is, is Atlas Shrugged, since, as you know, I'm, I'm halfway through with it and, and now at the point of binge reading. So in, enjoying it enormously. I hope to finish it in a, in a few weeks. and. Um, um, be fun to hold some hangouts on that one, right? Thank you all so much, all Liberty Me members. If if you somehow are watching and not a member, 
uh, use this opportunity right now to, to come and join us. Um, people are so happy. I get notes all day from new members that say, I can't believe I waited so long to join you. I'm so glad I'm in now. So I think, I think if you're not a member, um, you will enjoy it. The other thing is existing members, go out and recruit some people. Um, uh, get some more people in, into the community uh, where we can share uh, time together and share ideas and exchange ideas with each other. I love being part of this community. I know you do too. Thank you all so much, and I look forward to seeing you next week. All the best. Bye-bye, my friends. Bye-bye.